Hypothetical question for you. What if frogs ruled the Earth? Not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of their position in the ecosystem. Amphitera is a speculative biology project by the talented artist and writer Roxy Valdez, which imagines the incredible and surreal forms frogs might achieve if given the perfect environment to evolve. While the world of Amphitera often looks like an alien planet, the artist imagines it's actually an alternate timeline of Earth, where subtly different climatic conditions led to early amphibians outcompeting the first dinosaurs in proto-mammals. What creatures will develop and thrive in this drastically different history? For this entry into the archive, we'll be exploring the fascinating possibilities of the Amphitera project. And remember to support Roxy Valdez on Patreon using the links below if you're a fan of this project. Now let's leap back 252 million years and begin our tour through the timeline of Amphitera. Our epic tale of frog ascendancy begins in the early Triassic, with the oldest member of the frog lineage, the diminutive Triadobatrachus. This amphibian is present in our timeline as well, but in the alternate world of Amphitera, the wetter, damper conditions will lead Triadobatrachus to be better suited for the period than early synapsids and reptiles. As a result, its descendants will rise to the top of this primordial Earth. By the late Triassic in what is now Nigeria, the common eofrog has emerged from the Triadobatrachus and represents the first major deviation from our world. Brought on by the ideal conditions of this alternate timeline, the eofrog is, essentially, just a big frog. But over many eons, it will provide the anatomical basis for the most significant species of this alternate reality. The reign of the amphibians has now begun. By the early Jurassic, the descendants of the eofrog have evolved to fill various major niches across the ecosystems of the world. In the marshy plains, an effective predator has emerged in the form of the amusingly named Greater Moist Boy. While these lifeforms have a comical appearance, the advance they represent is tremendous, having brought their limbs under their body to be taller and faster than their competition. The Moist Boy also possesses an enlarged clavicular ring, which essentially functions like a rib cage and helps support their growing weight. Many of the most successful predators of the future will branch off from this design. In the rainforests of what is now northern Africa, the marbled snapapple perches on a branch. This early tree dweller has evolved a creeping, unpredictable form of movement convergent with our timeline's chameleons, and will serve as the foundation for various unusual offshoots. Already, it is becoming more sedentary, a lifestyle that will continue until it reaches truly extreme levels. In the forests of what is now Eastern Africa, another major tree-climbing species has emerged in the lanky frogget. While they still spend some time on the forest floor, these thin, long-legged organisms are expert climbers, patiently navigating from branch to branch. Even more than the snapapple, the frogget's descendants will be the champions of the world's canopies. And the last major niche filled is that of the grazing herbivore, which is currently occupied by the lowland dogus. These herd-dwelling lifeforms are the cousins of the greater moist boy, and have similarly made the critical advancement of raising their frame off the ground. A wide range of future herbivorous megafauna will owe their evolutionary ancestry to the Dogus, as the various eofrog descendants continue to diversify and expand in number. On the dry plains of the Cretaceous period, a mighty predator comes to rule. The bullpronks are the descendants of the greater moist boy, and have become efficient pack predators. They hunt grazing animals in coordinated prides, much like lions in our modern day. To communicate while on patrol, the bullpronks can raise and lower their tails like signal flags, and even flush them with color. These tails are actually a retained trait from their tadpole stage, showing these lifeforms have had to get creative to take over niches typically unassociated with amphibians. And speaking of getting creative, in the misty rainforests of the north, the mottled sucker lump is a creature whose specialized lifestyle has caused a tremendous shift in its body plan. Even more than their ancestors, the marbled snapapples, these animals are incredibly inactive, 
with some spending their entire adult life rooted to a single branch, like an amphibious barnacle. As with our timeline's flatfish, their anatomy seems absurd, yet is actually perfectly suited for their methods of survival. The sucker lump's lifestyle requires few calories, so they can subsist on insects that come into range of their projectile tongue. And with their characteristic mottled coloring, they can hide effectively from their prey, until it's too late. And further along into the Cretaceous, an even stranger variant of the sucker lump will emerge under the waves. The tropical frondel can be found nestled in underwater shallows, and has a truly bizarre lifestyle. Beginning as a free-swimming tadpole, once they mature, they never develop limbs, becoming completely stationary filter feeders. This lifestyle requires very little brain power, so like the soft-bodied sea squirts of our timeline, the tropical frondel, shockingly, digests most of their brains upon reaching adulthood, repurposing the valuable proteins elsewhere. The frondel's most characteristic adult feature is their highly derived tongue, which has evolved sticky branches to catch the planktonic organisms the frondel survives on. At this point in the timeline, some creatures have clearly become unrecognizable as amphibians. And high in the treetops around the same period, a frog with an equally bizarre body plan makes its home. The tree frixel is a descendant of the lanky froggit, the other tree-dwelling specialist that emerged alongside the snapapple. The tree frixel is even better adapted for the trees, however with a body plan that at first seems implausibly awkward, but makes perfect sense when the tree frixel is in its element. Like our primates, the tree frixel swings through the canopy above, with their hind limbs perfectly positioned to navigate from branch to branch, as this biomechanical visualization illustrates. As a result, the tree frixels have developed thumb-like digits, and a general rise in cognitive ability. Given time, they may give rise to something truly special. One relative of the Frixel will take a very different path than its tree-climbing cousins. In the forests of our timeline Central America, you might spot a gliding alu. Thus far in the Amphibitarian timeline, amphibians have yet to conquer the skies in the way our birds or bats have, as the ectothermic, low-metabolism bodies of amphibians aren't well equipped for the rigors of powered flight. But the alu has found a loophole. To hunt, it climbs up trees and uses eyes rotated almost to the back of its head to calculate the distance of its prey. Once a target is locked, the alu leaps back first towards the forest floor, using primitive wings and a specialized sack that inflates to provide drag to slow its descent. As bizarre as the alu's strategy might seem, it is not unlike the early dinosaurs, like Archaeopteryx in our own timeline, that achieved flight. The future may yet hold skies dominated by the Alu's curiously inverted descendants. Speaking of curious descendants, at the very end of the Cretaceous period, the arid grasslands will give rise to a creature so bizarre it's at first difficult to comprehend. This is an inhabited lorge, a slow bulky herbivore that is the descendant of the lowland Dogus. At a glance, the slow-moving lorge might seem vulnerable to predation. But the Lorge has its own private security, in the form of the colonial gobelins, a species that have evolved to live within the Lorge's hump. The tiny gobelins are actually another branch of the banded sucker lump's unusual family tree, and they have developed a close symbiotic relationship with their living nests. At the first sign of danger, the gobelin horde will exit the Lorge, and swarm an attacker until it backs off. It's an effective strategy, yet this highly specialized pairing won't have many offshoots going forward in a changing world. Yet another descendant of the lowland Dogus will continue on. Upon the cold tundra of the early tertiary period, one amphibian has found an ingenious way to survive the cold. The foaming squander lives farther north than most amphibian megafauna can exist. Yet the squander stays warm thanks to its eponymous foam. Specialized pores on the squander's back produce a thick, towering covering of insulating foam. This foam is similar to the mucus coating some frogs in our timeline produce to keep their skin moist. The squander's foam is unique, however, as it traps heat within its structure, allowing the squander to roam the polar reaches. With this clever adaptation, descendants of the squander will be well equipped for the cooling climate. 
To the south, another species that will have many successful descendants dominates the dry steppe. The steppe fragon is a carnivorous behemoth, distantly related to the nimble pack-hunting plains bullpronk. Now highly territorial, the massive steppe fragon no longer has a need for a pack, hunting all on its own. But the steppe fragon is actually an omnivore, with a lifestyle that could be compared to a bear, gorging itself to build fat for a winter hibernation. As the planet continues to cool, the fragons will endure, and will diversify in unexpected ways. But one creature whose fate is more mysterious inhabits the trees of temperate environments. High in the canopy, the astonishing freeple live in elevated, wooden villages. A descendant of the tree Frixel, freeple have achieved a level of intelligence roughly analogous to a human. Like male frigate birds, under their chin, freeple have a highly developed golar sac for communication. But freeple communication is highly complex, with their language almost comparable to a curious form of Morse code. Even more curiously, it seems the freeple vanish from the Amphibitaran timeline several million years after their evolution. What fate befell these enigmatic creatures? Did they die out, or given time, reach a level of advancement that allowed for a different kind of exit? We have no way to say for sure, but no matter the nature of their departure, the freeple's absence makes room for even stranger species. By the late tertiary, an isolated island environment has given rise to a stunning life form. The splendid fragon is a descendant of the steppe fragon that has become a peaceful herbivore, spending its day wading through swampy jungles on graceful, stilt-like legs. With a vibrant coloring, a splendid fragon silently picking their way through their island home would likely be a magnificent sight. They feed on mushrooms that grow in this region in abundance foregoing the omnivorous lifestyle of their ancestor. On the mainland, however, another Fragon descendant has taken the opposite path. The catastrophic Fragon is the largest land-dwelling carnivore the world of Amphitera has ever seen. The catastrophic Fragon's rotund anatomy might seem surprising at a glance, as it almost looks too bulky to be able to stand. Yet examining the animal's skeleton, the Fragon center of gravity is a clavicular ring that began overdeveloping all the way back in the greater Moist Boy. This ring acts as the linchpin to the Fragon's massive bulk. While the catastrophic Fragon's reign is amazing, it's also rather short. An impending drop in temperature will cause the age of the Fragon to end prematurely. Yet one type of Fragon, already well adapted to the cold, will live on. The Arctic Fragon thrives into the late tertiary, protected from the cold thanks to layers of blubber and a thick hide. Its most unique adaptation to stay warm, however, is the thick coating of fur on its underside. These hairs are actually dermal palpillae, tubes of skin and fatty tissue that trap warm air against a Fragon's body much like fur. And since the Amphitaran Ice Age is imagined to be less severe than our own, the Arctic Fragons have all they need to continue to thrive. But there are other ways of surviving the cold. A short distance south, the Eon Toad are a species with a very different method of enduring the long winter months. The Eon Toad is actually a descendant of the Foaming Squander that has traded its foaming coat for something even stranger. Eon Toads enter a state of hibernation that can last multiple years, enduring periods of minor freezing and unfreezing as it waits for the perfect spring to become active again. While this type of cold protection is rarely seen in an animal, some plants contain cryoprotectors that stop their cells from lethal shrinkage while they allow themselves to be frozen solid for long periods. And on the subject of plants, the Eon Toad will often wake to find many types of vegetation have grown over its body, which can be harmful if left unchecked. And in the same region, the final species of this timeline can be found which serve as an example of just how alien the fauna of Amphitera can be. The foaming troglefolk are another descendant of the foaming squander, which are quite a bit smaller than their ancestors. Incredibly, troglefolk live in villages constructed from their characteristic foam, which freeze into solid structures due to the cold. They're also highly communal, sculpting the foam on the bodies of family members into regionally distinct styles. This social grooming behavior is not unlike that of certain primates in our timeline, and shows an emerging intelligence. 
Indeed, certain communities of Trogol folk have begun cultivating edible fungus within their nest, demonstrating the beginnings of agriculture. Like the Freepal before them, the Trogol folks may rise to incredible heights. Over the course of this journey, we've seen pseudo frogs rise and fall, evolve incredible adaptations, and fulfill unexpected niches. But now, we must return to our own timeline, where frogs, though not quite as abundant, are still quite wonderful. If you enjoyed learning about Amphitera as much as I did, you can support Roxy Valdez on Patreon and social media using the links in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support, and like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.